I welcome you all to the second chapter of Hornbill. We are not afraid to die if we can all be together. The title itself has a lot to say. We are not afraid to die if conditions apply, if we can all be together. Very beautiful, a real adventurous story. Let's move on. Written by Gordon Cook and Alan East. Let's know a little about them before we move on. Gordon Cook was born on December 3rd, 1978 in Toronto, Ontario in Canada. He is a two-time Canadian Olympic sailor who sails for Royal Canadian Yacht Club. He had great interest in writing stories too. Well, that's about Gordon Cook. Moving on to Alan East, was born in November 18, 1923 in East Derry, New Hampshire. He was admitted to the role of solicitors in 2003 and has gained extensive experience as a litigator, manager and legal trainer. In 2010, Alan joined Coventry University as senior lecturer in law. Well, a lot about the two of them, very talented people. And now to the plot of the story. The narrator, Gordon Cook, his wife, Mary, and their children, Jonathan and Suzanne, set sail on a ship to imitate the historical round-the-world voyage undertaken by James Cook in 1768. So basically, they are repeating the round-the-world voyage, which was first initially done by James Cook, and now the four of them, it's the entire family, the father, mother, the son, and the daughter, they want to go round the world. The journey began from Plymouth, England, and headed south to Cape Town, South Africa. It was expected to journey to Australia through the endless Indian Ocean and finally return to England. Unfortunately, the ship partially wrecked in the Indian Ocean and the sailors faced death very close. You can imagine a lot of suspense in this uh, story. So just wait and watch as we move on. The, narrator, the narrative describes the near death experience of these hapless people, hapless as in the people which had a lot of hard luck. Their hard work, the children's encouraging messages, their willingness to die with their father and mother, hours of endurance, and finally their reaching lie Amsterdam, a tiny island. So you see now, I think the title makes a lot of sense to you. So, you know, we are not afraid to die. If we can all be together, this is what it is. The entire family is together. So they are all ready to face death together, hand in hand. Wow. So let's see, uh, talk about the characters before we move on. Narrator is the captain of the ship. Mary, wife of the narrator. Jonathan, six-year-old son of the narrator. Suzanne, seven-year-old daughter of the narrator. Larry Vigil, American crewman hired from Cape Town and Herb Segler, Swiss crewman hired from Cape Town. So these are the characters involved in our story. Let's begin. In July 1976, my wife Mary, son Jonathan who was six, daughter Suzanne who was seven and I set sail from Plymouth, England to duplicate the round the world voyage made 200 years earlier by Captain James Cook. Now, just like we, when we discussed the plot of the story, we spoke of the same. Now, the family, the entire family, the father, mother, son and daughter, they set off on sail. From where was they starting? From Plymouth, England to the destination was they wanted to do the round the world voyage. Now, this had been done 200 years ago by Captain James Cook. So they wanted to experience this sea journey just like he did. For the longest time, Mary and I, now who's the I? The narrator, a 37-year-old businessman had dreamt of sailing in the wake of the famous explorer 
and for the past 16 years, we had spent all our leisure time honing our seafaring skills in British waters. Now, they were so keen on this voyage, they wanted to really go round the world. So, for the same, they had given, they had done a lot of planning and they had done a lot of practice. Imagine they used all their honing, I mean, all their leisure time honing their seafaring skills. Now, seafaring skills as in the sea traveling skills. It's not very easy to be on sea for at a stretch so many days and probably months together. You need a lot of practice. You really need to improve on those skills. You need to actually be a perfectionist. Only then will you be able to survive such an adventurous journey. So yes, this is how it was. Our boat, Wave Walker, that was the name of the boat. A 23 meter, 30 ton wooden hulled beauty. Wooden hulled beauty as in it was the boat made of wood, right? It had been professionally built. It had been built by professionals. Why? I mean, it was a very obvious thing because it was setting on a very long journey. So the professionals know their job the best. So it's for them to do it. You, A layman cannot just go about it. And we had spent months fitting it out, fitting it out as in we to supply with necessities and testing it in the roughest weather we could find. Now they had to even test that boat. How, how much can uh, it manage? How, mu how much is it capable of taking the rough weather? So they did all the checking, all the testing to make sure that it goes. The first leg of our planned three year, 105 million kilometer journey passed pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. Now here it was, now this was there, this actually journey, I mean they were planning it since three years. So you see one like 5,000 kilometer journey, it passed pleasantly, it started pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. Till there everything was going smooth, everything was fine. There, before heading east, we took on two crewmen, American Larry Vigil and Swiss Herb Segler, to help us tackle one of the world's roughest seas, the Southern Indian Ocean. Now, he did not go alone. Now, obviously, he was not uh, able to manage it himself. So he did take help with him. He took the uh, two extra men, two more men working on the ship and they were Larry Vigil, he was from America, and Swiss Herb Segler. Now, both of them were on board with the entire family to make sure that they go across the world's roughest seas, the southern Indian Ocean. They had to be extremely, extremely careful there. Very cautious they had to be. So, on our second day out of Cape Town, we began to encounter strong gales. What do you mean by strong gales? Extremely strong winds. See, the meanings provided to you right here is going to help you to understand every line, every word better, right? So, now they began to encounter, they began to face strong, extremely strong winds. For the next few weeks, they blew continuously. Now, for the next few weeks, as they were moving, they were facing those strong winds. Gales did not worry me. Now, that was not the problem. But the size of the waves was alarming. Up to 15 meters as high as our main mast. Now, the winds were not a problem to the narrator. What he says was, what was actually scary out there were the size of the waves. The size of the waves was very, it was really getting scary. Why? Because it was going up to 15 meters. How high was that? As high as the main mast. You know, the mast of a ship is that tall pole in a ship supporting the sails. Now, the waves were going that high, right? 15 meters high. Now, that was something uh, which was actually, you know, scaring them a lot. Came December 25th. December 25th found us 3,500 kilometers east of Cape Town. Now, on Christmas, they had reached over there. Despite atrocious weather, despite this extremely bad weather, we had a wonderful holiday 
complete with a Christmas tree. Now, despite instead, in spite of having this bad weather, yet they managed to enjoy their Christmas and they also had a Christmas tree with them. New Year's Day saw no improvement in the weather. They thought maybe, you know, from 25th December till New Year's till the 1st of Jan, probably things will get better, you know, it will improve. But uh, bad luck, there was no improvement in the weather. But we reasoned that it had to change soon. We were expecting it to change very soon. And it did change, but for the worse. They thought it might stop, it'll gradually, you know, slow down, you know, the strong winds. But then it did change, but it worsened up. It became still bad. At dawn on January 2nd, at dawn as in early in the morning, when, the, it, when it was just about to, uh, the sun to rise, the waves were gigantic. Gigantic means they were really super-sized waves. They were really high waves. We were sailing with only a small storm jib and were still making eight knots. Now here they were sailing with a very small storm jib as in it is something which is a very strong and a heavy sail. They, were, they had a very small one. Now not really expecting this bad weather, they somehow managed to carry that small one. How did they manage with it? As the ship rose to the top of each wave, now to the top of each wave, you remember it was going nearly 15 meters high. We could see the endless, enormous seas rolling towards us. Now as the waves kept coming by, we could see the entire sea literally coming towards us. It was coming towards their boat. And the screaming of the wind and spray was painful to the ears. Now it was so bad, it was so atrocious that even the scream, it's, he's calling it the screaming of the wind. Yeah, the, the wind was literally screaming so loudly and the spray was actually extremely painful to the ears. They could not bear it. <clears throat> to slow the boat down, we dropped the storm jib. The storm jib again, a strong and a heavy sail. So to slow it down, what they did was they brought that down. They dropped it down and they lashed a heavy mooring rope. What is a mooring rope? It is a rope to tie the boat. So what they did was they lashed a heavy mooring rope in a loop across the stern. Stern is what? The back end of the ship. So they literally tied it so that that ship stays intact. Then we double lashed everything. Then they tied out everything, not once, but twice. They double lashed everything. They went through our life raft drill. They had a drill. You know, you have this life raft. Whenever you go, uh, you must have traveled on cruise and stuff. So you see they have a raft over there. And they actually tell you how to go about it in case of an emergency. Now that's a drill. They actually even practice that, that in case this ship breaks down or it sinks or it you know turns over we need to get onto the raft and how they even checked on all the details they attached lifelines the lifelines was the rope used for life saving they even attached they were quickly getting ready because they could see that things are getting way out of control so they started taking all the measures to put themselves to safety they donned oil skins donned oil skins as in they wore the cloth waterproofed with oil so that they don't get wet you know it was waterproof at all that special uh, suit the special dress also they put on and life jackets they did all these measures they took and they waited waited hoping wishing and praying that things get in control but just in case they don't they were all set to be safe the first indication of impending disaster came at about 6 p.m. Now, the disaster which was about to happen, it started at 6 p.m. in the evening with an ominous silence. Ominous silence as an unpleasant silence. There was a very strange silence. It was not really pleasing. Generally, we love silence, but this was a very unpleasant one. The wind dropped and the sky immediately grew dark. Now, just visualize the scene as I'm reading it out to you. Just visualize this whole thing happening. Then came a growing roar 
and an enormous cloud towered aft of the ship. Now, suddenly what happened was the wind dropped, the sky became dark, then came a growing roar. There was a loud roaring sound and an enormous cloud towered, towered as in it came near the backside of the ship. There was a, there was a nice big huge cloud right near the back of the ship. With horror, I realized that it was not a cloud. What was it then? It was a wave like no one, none other I had ever seen. No one must have come across that wave. I had seen it myself for the first time. That thing was not a cloud. You can just imagine he was there and suddenly he realizes that there's such a huge wave coming up. It appeared perfectly vertical and almost twice the height of the other waves with a frightful breaking crest. Now when he saw it, he said it appeared perfectly vertical. It was right vertical and it was twice the height of the normal waves and it had a frightful breaking crest. The crest on top, that thing, the way it was coming, it was totally like a breaking crest. It was a breaking top. Now, next, just let's go ahead. The roar increased to a thunder as the stern moved up the face of the wave. Now, the roar went on increasing. It went on, the, the noise went on becoming louder like a thunder. As the stern moved up the wave, the face of the wave and for a moment, I thought, we might ride over it. For a second, I thought maybe we will ride over it. But then, to their bad luck, a tremendous explosion shook the deck. There was a tremendous explosion which shook the deck, that is the roof of the ship. Now, you can just imagine that wave was not even of the normal height. It was literally double the size and the loud roar. So, you can imagine the intensity of that wave the impact of the wave and this is how this was the actual impact of the wave. A torrent of green and white water broke over the ship literally like a current. It was a torrent. My head smashed into the wheel. Now he was on the wheel. So his head, the force was so big. You remember that wave was coming from behind. It came from the back. So as it came like this, his head in front hit the wheel and I was aware of flying overboard, he was literally into the water and sinking below the waves. That's where he felt, that's how he had that much of sense at that point of time. I accepted my approaching death. That scene was so terrible, it was so disastrous. He could think of nothing but death. He already accepted his approaching death and, uh, and as I was losing consciousness, I felt quite peaceful, obviously, because then he wouldn't know what's going to, ha what's happening to him or rather what's going on around him. Why? Because he was losing consciousness. And so he said, I felt peaceful. Unexpectedly, my head popped out of the water. A few meters away, wave walker was near capsizing, capsizing as in it was just about to overturn. You can see the scene right here, the picture here. So little, I mean, very, I mean, after a little time, his head popped out of the water. He felt, you know, he was into the water. He, his head popped out and a few meters away, he could see, see his boat. The name of the boat was Wave Walker, if you remember. So it was about to capsize, capsize, it was about to overturn. Her mass almost horizontal, it had gone flat. It was with the sea water. Then a wave hurled her upright, hurled her as in it with great force because of the wave, the ship actually became straight. It became upright and straight. My lifeline jerked taut. My lifeline jerked taut as in it stretched or it pulled tightly. The lifeline, the, the jacket that he was wearing. I grabbed the guard rails and sailed through the air into the wave walkers main boom. Now what happened was as he could see he, a little into his senses, he could see it was right there. He saw that the waves came, the ship became straight. So very quickly he grabbed the guard rails. He took the guard rails and he sailed through the air into the 
wave walker's main boom main boom as in the pole to adjust the angle of the sail he took the support of that subsequent waves tossed me around the deck like a rag doll now subsequent waves the following waves the waves that kept coming obviously there's no stopping so they kept coming and they kept tossing him around the deck like a rag doll my left ribs cracked obviously you know he had smashed against the wheel so he had also got hurt on his ribs so my left ribs cracked my mouth filled with blood and broken teeth somehow i found the wheel lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on now some how he managed it he managed he found the wheel he got onto the wheel he lined up the stern for the next wave and he hung on he made sure now he faces the next wave and he just tried standing there he took control of it water water everywhere everywhere all that he could see was water right they were right in the middle i could feel that the ship had water below but i dared not abandon the wheel to investigate he says i could feel that you know the water has entered the ship below but what did do is he could not stop looking after the wheel he says i cannot leave this wheel right now it is not the right time to do it so he stood right there and he made sure that he takes care of it rather than going down to check what has happened that could have happened later right now he had to take control of the ship suddenly the front hatch was thrown open and mary appeared the front hatch as in the front door it opened and his wife appeared we are sinking she screamed now they were right there inside she says we are actually sinking the decks are smashed we are full of water she says the ship is sinking everything is covered with water we need to do something take the wheel i shouted as i scrambled for the hatch he he told her okay fine right now you just take control of this wheel while i scramble he moved quickly using hands and legs he went really quickly for the hatch now this was the situation where they had to stay on the alert mode they couldn't give up they couldn't cry generally in such situations you know you just land up crying and you're scary you're nervous but right now he was in his senses and he made sure that they could turn out you know very safely out of the situation now if you remember the two crewmen larry and herb larry and herb were pumping like mad men they were pumping out the water the water which had entered the ship they were trying to pump it out broken timbers hung at crazy angles the whole starboard side bulged inwards now what was happening the broken timbers now a boat if you remember like it was wooden hulled so it was made of wood right so those broken timbers those wooden boards which were used in the ships they were they were hung at crazy angles the whole starboard side starboard side as in the right side of the ship it had bulged inwards it had gone inside clothes crockery charts tins and toys sloshed about in deep water everything that they were carrying with them absolutely everything it was sloshed as in it was floating in the water i half swam half crawled into the children's cabin are you all right i asked now now after you know seeing all this after trying to take control he realizes he needs to see his children remember they were really small merely 6 or 7 years old so you can imagine the condition they were going through they were so small so he quickly ran to the children he went to their cabin and he asked them are you people all right yes they answered now see the brave children just check how brave they have acted how beautifully they have done yes they answered from an upper bunk you remember the bunk is you know the beds that you have in the walls you have three layers so they were on the upper layer on the upper bunk but my head hurts a bit said sue pointing to a big bump above her eyes she says actually my this head you know there was a big swollen thing on her head because that wave that uh, boat had got such a big jerk so even she had got hurt and this part had bulged it had got swollen so she tells her dad that i had no time to worry about bumped heads now 
that situation was so bad he says right now i couldn't take care of it generally a parent cannot see the child hurt of even a small thing but right now was such a critical time for them that they didn't have to bother about all this right now these things were small they were petty right now they had to save their lives so what does he do after finding a hammer screws and canvas now he quickly started searching for all the things that he needed he even took canvas canvas was a rough cloth i struggled back on the deck he quickly went on to the deck with the starboard side you remember the right side of the ship which had bulged inside he bashed open bashed open as in he struck it hard he opened it we were taking water with each wave that broke over us literally we were facing every wave that because it had bent inside so they were facing that problem if i couldn't make some repairs we would surely sink if he wouldn't take care of these things right now they had no chance to survive the ship was definitely going to sink somehow i managed to stretch canvas and secure waterproof hatch covers across the gaping holes now somewhere he managed to get the canvas the gaping there were wide open holes so he tried to block them there waterproof hatch covers some water continued to stream below but most of it was now being deflected over the side deflected as in it had caused to change direction it started coming from the other side more problems arose when our hand pumps started to block up with the debris floating around the cabins and the electric pump short circuited problems were not stopping they were multiplying they were adding what more problems came up are uh, the hand pumps started to get blocked up why because there was debris there was scattered remains and rubbish you know of the cabin right it was floating around the cabin and even the electric pump got a short circuit imagine all the things that they could use to save everything was giving up the water level rose threateningly now that was more than you know scary more than scary it was like death is just there back on deck i quickly went on the deck i found that our two spare hand pumps had been wrenched as if they had pulled suddenly they had been removed overboard along with the four stay sail four stay sail as in the front big sail of the ship the jib and the dinghies and the main anchor the small open boats all these had been totally wrenched they had been pulled suddenly they had been removed overboard along with all these all these things had totally been removed because it was so difficult to control at that point of time then i remembered we had an another electric pump under the chart room floor what is a chart room it is the room on ship where charts and maps are stored so they have a lot of charts and maps stored over there he remembered that there was an electric pump there now do you see the presence of mind he is trying to take i mean you know he's trying to recollect anything and everything that uh, that can save them he's trying it till his last breath he is not giving up i connected it to an outpipe and was thankful to find that it worked oh thank god at least this one worked the night dragged on with an endless bitterly cold routine of pumping steering and working the radio the whole night all that they did was and it was bitterly cold it was extremely cold and what they had to do was pumping they had to keep pumping the water out the steering they had to steer the ship and of course working the radio trying to get connected to someone we were getting no replies to our mayday calls mayday calls these are the sos signals save our soul signals sent for help usually from a ship or a plane they went on making such calls that we are in trouble please save us but they were not getting any i mean you know no one was reverting to that which was not surprising in this remote corner of the world remote as in having very little connection that the place that they were stuck was some corner of the world where hardly any people go 
Sue's head had swollen um, alarmingly. Her head, you know, she had got hurt. It was swelling. She had two enormous black eyes and now she showed us a deep cut on her arm. When I asked why she hadn't made more of her injuries before this, she replied, I didn't want to worry you when you were trying to save us all. She showed her cuts, her eyes, the, that swelling had become more, her eyes had become black and she had even got a deep cut in her arm. But when she got all this, she did not mention it to her parents. Then when her dad says, why didn't you tell me this before? She says, I did not want to tell you. I did not want you to get more worried as it is you were trying to save all of us. So how could I add to your troubles? You were already surrounded with so many troubles. I mean, so cute, so thoughtful that little girl was. Yeah. By morning on January 3rd, the pumps had the water level sufficiently under control for us to take two hours rest in rotation. So now they had these pumps at the water, which had the water level sufficiently under control. They were working that much that they were under control. And what they could do is they could all take two hours of rest in rotation. One would get up, one would sleep, one would get up. So that's how they managed it. But we still had a tremendous leak somewhere below the water line. Water line as in underwater you know where the ship is underwater there they definitely had a big leak and on checking i found that nearly all the boats main rib frames the main rib frames as in you know the frame of the wood the actual main one were smashed down to the keel to the keel is that piece of wood or steel running along the bottom of the ship to keep it upright so basically that main support yeah so he found that these were smashed down to the keel. In fact, there was nothing holding up a whole section of the starboard hull except a few cupboard partitions. There were just a few partitions basically that were actually holding the boat upright. Now, we had survived for 15 hours since the wave hit. Now, after the wave had actually hit them for 15 hours, they managed to survive. But wave walker wouldn't hold together long enough for us to reach Australia. Their destination, definitely the, show, the, the ship was not in that position to reach them to Australia. I checked our charts and calculated that there were two small islands a few hundred kilometers to the east. Now he checked on his map. He said, okay, now somewhere they had to halt, you know, somewhere they had to get things done again. So he found that there were two islands somewhere close by that's a few hundred kilometers to the east. Now they were trying to look at how they could manage it out. One of them, Ile Amsterdam, Ile is island in French, it means the word island in French, was a French scientific base. Our only hope was to reach these pinpricks in the vast ocean. Pinpricks as in tiny like pinpricks in an ocean. In the ocean you just find a little bit of these, you know, little piece of land over there. But unless the wind and seas abated, Till the wind and the seas, they removed that nuisance, you know, they stopped giving us any more trouble. So we could hoist the sail, we could raise using the ropes and pulleys, their sail was down, you remember. So they would have somehow tried doing that. <clears throat> our chances would be slim indeed. The great wave had put our auxiliary engine out of action. Auxiliary engine also the supplementary engine. Even that had gone out of action. So they were sort of in deep trouble and they had to make sure that they'd catch up somewhere very soon. On January 4th, after 36 hours of continuous pumping, we reached the last few centimeters of water. Now, we had only to keep pace as in to maintain the current speed with the water still coming in. The water was continuously coming in. The pump was actually moving out. So there was somewhere a certain balance that was happening. We could not set any sail on the main mast. You know, the main pole where they put the mast. They could not do it there. They could not set any sail over there. 
प्रेशर ऑन द रिगिंग ऑन द रिगिंग एज इन अ सिस्टम ऑफ रोप्स और चेन्स एम्प्लॉयड टू सपोर्ट अ शिप्स मास्ट नाउ हियर इट वॉज प्रेशर ऑन दैट पर्टिक्युलर पार्ट वुड सिंपली पुल द डैमेज सेक्शन ऑफ द हल अ पार्ट सो वी हॉइस्टेड द स्टॉम जेब एंड हेडेड फॉर वेर आई थॉट द टू आईलैंड वर नाउ वॉट दे डिड वॉज now because that thing was very risky to put up the sail on that so what they did was they hoisted the storm jib you remember it was something to protect them and to keep moving so they thought that and they started sailing towards where he thought the two islands were mary found some corned beef and cracker biscuits some food to eat basically and we ate our first meal in almost Two days. Now you can imagine what they were going through. Death any time in front of them, right? Nothing in the stomach. Full pressure, full tension. No idea what's happening next. They were terribly in a bad shape. But our respite was short-lived. respite as in the short period of rest you remember at least they were getting those 2 hours you know of rotational rest but that was not very long again what happened was at 4 pm black clouds began building up behind us within the hour the wind was back to 40 knots 40 knots here knots is basically the unit of speed so you know it was way faster and the seas were getting higher now as the wind blew the seas started getting higher the weather continued to deteriorate deteriorate as in it became worse and worse throughout the night and by dawn on january 5th our situation was again desperate again we were in a very critical situation when i went in to comfort the children now this is a very sweet portion just pay attention when i went in to comfort the children john asked daddy are we going to die oh my god you can just imagine i tried to assure him that we could make it he says don't worry now as a parent obviously he won't tell him that yes we are going to die but he says don't worry we will make it but daddy he went on we aren't afraid of dying if we can all be together he says dad don't worry we are okay we we are ready to die but as long as we all four are together you and mummy sue and i i could find no words with which to respond now this was highly emotional highly emotional imagine your child telling you such a young child telling you that oh we are all ready to die but let as long as we are all together now come on that's that's something really big such a small child saying such big words highly emotional but i left the children's cabin determined to fight the sea with everything i had when he saw that coming from the children he was all the more determined he says no matter what i am going to fight the sea i am going to make it with whatever i have around me with whatever help whatever instruments tools whatever i have I am going to fight the sea. To protect the weakened starboard side, I decided to heave to to heave to as in to make a ship stop with the undamaged port hull facing the oncoming waves using an improvised sea anchor improvised as in he created without preparation he just made it up of heavy nylon rope and two 22 liter plastic barrels of paraffin that's you know the colorless flammable oily liquid now he tried once he came out of there since he was more determined to save all of them he started applying or he started you know using all this to see wherever possible this ship could get the protection and could move on so he took all these steps right he uh, he decided to heave with the undamaged port hull facing the oncoming waves he tried to stop it there using an improvised sea anchor you know the anchor of a uh, heavy nylon rope and two 22 liter plastic barrels of paraffin he tried to do that that evening mary and i sat together holding hands as the motion of the ship brought more and more water in 
through the broken planks. We both felt the end was very near. Now they both the husband and wife, they sat together that evening holding hands together and literally seeing that, okay, now somehow the things are uncontrollable. They are out of control. Now they felt, okay, death is very, very near. They could see it because the way the water kept coming in the ship, uh, there was no way they could help it. Nothing could be done really. So, yeah, they were trying to do it together. But Wave Walker rode out the storm. And by the morning of January 6th, with the wind easing, I tried to get a reading on the sextant. Now, gradually, this boat actually started, it came out of control. I mean, you know, it was totally out of that storm, right? And January 6th morning, on the morning of January 6th, the wind also eased down, okay? That speed came down. And I try to get a reading on the sextant. This is an instrument for measuring angles and distances. Now back in the chart room, you know, where they keep all the charts and they keep all the stuff there. I worked on the wind speeds, changes of course, drift and current. The current is basically the body of water moving in a definite direction. In which direction is that current going? That in an effort to calculate our position. Now, they didn't even know where they had landed up, where they were actually. So, he took the help of all these things, right, to calculate actually their position right now. Remember, he had thought of those two islands which were somewhere close by. So, whether they were there, near it, far from it, where. So, he wanted to get the actual position. The best I could determine was that we were somewhere in 1,50,000 kilometers of ocean looking for a 65 kilometer wide island. Now just check this out. They were somewhere in 1,50,000 kilometers of ocean. Okay, what they were looking for? A 65 kilometer wide island. Now this is where they had to make it. While I was thinking, Sue moving painfully joined me. Now, you know, she was moving painfully. You remember she had got that bump on the top of her eye. That thing was really hurting her. The left side of her head was now very swollen and her blackened eyes narrowed to slits. They were, you know, they had become like this. Her eyes had become minimum because that swelling went on. She gave me a card she had made. This is so cute. Such an innocent little baby. On the front, she had drawn caricatures of Mary and me with the words. Caricatures are a picture or a description or an imitation of a person in which certain striking characteristics are exaggerated in order to create a comic effect. Now what she had done, she had made the comic effect of her parents on the front of the card, right, of Mary and me. Now what were, what were the wordings that were written by her? Just check this out. Here are some funny people. Did they make you laugh? I laughed a lot as well. Inside was a message. Oh, how I love you both. So this card is to say thank you and let's hope for the best. Somehow we had to make it. Now those, you know, those motivating words, those encouraging words from the little baby actually you know, said, now, no matter what, but we have to make it. The way the words were put so innocently, so full of love, that he had no choice but to make it. So he said, somehow, we had to make it. I checked and rechecked my calculations. Calculations were to reach those islands. We had lost our main compass and I was using a spare which had not been corrected for magnetic variation. Now, the main compass was gone, all right? That was lost. Now, he was using a spare one, but that one had not been corrected for magnetic variation. I made an allowance for this. Allowance as in I took something into consideration while planning. While they were planning, they had thought of all this. I made an allowance for this and another estimate of the influence of the westerly currents. Westerly currents in westward position or direction. You remember the currents, they tell us the direction, right? So uh, of the westerly currents which flow through this part of the Indian Ocean, somewhere he had calculated all this. He had made an allowance. He had planned it. At about 2 p.m., I went on the deck and asked Larry 
to steer a course of 185 degrees. He said you move the steering, the wheel, to the course of 185 degrees. If we were lucky, I told him with a conviction, with a conviction as in with a firmly held belief or opinion, with total belief. He said if we were lucky, I did not feel he was, he had lost hopes internally. He could expect to see the island at about 5 p.m. He says if luck favors us, but internally he was lost. He says it doesn't really seem possible. We will hit the island at around 5 p.m. Then with a heavy heart, I went below, climbed on my bunk and amazingly dozed off. He went down, he went on the bunk, the bunker bed. He lied down and somehow he went off to sleep. When I woke up, it was 6 p.m. You remember he had told Larry that somewhere around 5 p.m. we will hit the island. So he went off to sleep saying that and he got up at 6 p.m. And it was growing dark. I knew we must have missed the island. He was already with the hope, you know, it was a very hopeless case for him. So he thought we must have missed the island and with the sail we had left, we couldn't hope to beat back into the westerly winds. He says, it's not possible to survive, in short. At that moment, a tousled head appeared by my bunk. A head with disarranged hair, you know, very untidy hair, appeared by my bunk. Can I have a hug? Jonathan asked. Sue was right behind him. Now, both the children had come up to his bunk and, you know, uh, he tells him that, can I have a hug? And Sue was just behind uh, Jonathan. Why am I getting a hug now? I asked. Now, he was fast asleep and suddenly he gets up and he sees, you know, that child with uh, untidy hair and the child is coming and saying, Jonathan is saying, please, can I have a hug? So, he's wondering what is the, I mean, why? Why would he do that suddenly? Because you are the best daddy in the whole world and the best captain, my son replied. Now, that's the reason he wanted to really go and hug him because telling him that you are the best dad and the best captain. Wow, it was a moment of achievement sort of for him. Not today, John, I'm afraid. Now, he did not know what had happened. So, he says, I don't think that's the right thing because if I am not able to save you people, I'm not the best dad, I'm not the best captain. Why? You must be, said Sue in a matter-of-fact voice. In a matter-of-fact voice as in, in an unemotional voice. She said, you should be. You found the island. What? I shouted. It's out there in front of us, they chorused as big as a battleship. He's saying it's right there. All of them said it together that it's right there in front of us, the island. I rushed on the deck and gazed with relief at the stark outline of Lil Alms Amsterdam. Now, stark is a very sharp and clear. You could actually see that island right there. It was only a bleak piece of volcanic rock with little vegetation the most beautiful island in the world. He says when he, see, when he finally saw it from there, it was only a bleak, as in a very uh, inhospitable, it was a very uh, discouraging sort of piece of volcanic rock. Pro, uh, you know, it is produced by a volcano. So bas basically, that rock must have just come from some volcano and it was there, right? It had very little vegetation on it, as in something growing, plants in a particular area. But it seemed the most beautiful island in the world. We anchored off shore. We anchored as in we secured in a position near the shore for the night. For the night, we just were secured there. And the next morning, all 28 inhabitants of the island. Inhabitants means the people living in that place. Now, total how many people were living in that place? Only 28. But the shocking part is they were living there. They were there. There were people living there. All of them cheered as they helped us ashore. All of them helped us on the shore of island. They really welcomed us with so much of love and warmth. With land under my feet again, my thoughts were full of Larry and Herbie, cheerful and optimistic under the direst stress, under the extremely serious stress, and of Mary, who stayed at the wheel for all those crucial hours. He says, when I step foot on that feet again, 
all I could do was express gratitude to these people who actually were optimistic even under the worst conditions. Larry and Herbie were optimistic even in those worst conditions and Mary took control of the wheel whenever she was really required over there for all the crucial hours, she was there. So because of all this, this was possible that I had land under my feet today. Most of all, I thought of a seven-year-old girl who did not want us to worry about the head injury. She had the head injury, but she did not want to tell her dad about it, which subsequently took six minor operations to remove a recurring blood clot. Recurring as in it was happening repeatedly, that blood clot was happening again and again between the skin and the skull. And of a six-year-old boy who was not afraid to die. He says, this somehow, you know, when, when that, that land was touched, you know, by my feet, I thought of all these people, how they actually helped us to cope out of that worse situation. So this was it. They finally managed to make it. They fought those rough seas. They fought those high waves. They fought all the worst situations they could have ever faced during the sea journey. How? Why? Because they were all together. Everyone played their role and as a team, as a team, they made it through. They survived and today they were all breathing fit and fine. This is what matters the most as a team when you work together. It's not that I, as a team, it is we, W-E, we, right? This is how we actually can fight any situation in life as long as you are together with your family and friends. So yes, this is a very beautiful message that is being conveyed to us through this lesson. They say a person needs just three things to be truly happy in this world. What are those three things? Someone to love, something to do, and something to hope for. Yes, never give up hope. Stay together and let's stay together, you and I. Let's keep watching and keep learning.